Hi, I'm Neil, and I'm a leftist, not a liberal. I'm not a liberal, I'm a leftist. Liberal Cook is the name of the channel. It's a joke. It's a joke. It's a weak pun that defines my life now. I'm quite what I identify as that thing when it's clearly... And also, I'm Irish. Hadn't you noticed? I only mention it in every video. Couldn't you tell in diddly na, diddly dee -di and up the ra. And today, we're going to talk about Ireland in this post-pandemic era. I got my vaccine. Of course, it's only post-pandemic here as COVID-19 rages across most of the rest of the world, which is awful. And it's only almost post-pandemic here. Any, any months now. Well, today we're gonna to talk about that and why we should absolutely not return to normal. Normal is awful. And while we're talking about Ireland and why we should absolutely not return to normal because normal is awful, we're also going to make a vegan breakfast roll. But what's a breakfast roll? Why, it's only the most important Irish culinary invention of the last 30 years. But in order to know that, you'd have to give a shit about Ireland, which nobody does, except for one magical day of the year when people from all around the United States gather together to eat corned beef and impersonate Tom Cruise in Far and Away. And corned beef isn't even Irish, but I am. I'm as Irish as a baguette, smothered in butter from the butter fields of County Cork, stuffed with sausages, rashers, black and white pudding, hash browns from the mountains of Donegal, and a bit of a fried egg. It's got it. <laughs> Catch up sometimes and also served at the deli counter of a petrol station. That's a breakfast roll. That's Ireland. But all of this begs three questions. Number one, why am I talking about Ireland? Number two, why should you care? And number three, how on earth am I gonna make this monstrosity vegan? Number one, well, we'll get to the why, but for now, isn't it interesting that when you do try to talk about a country that isn't the United States or the United Kingdom, you're either faced with this kind of exceptionalism, yeah, America, greatest country in the world, Britain, the finest jam sandwich in all the seven seas, or you get this, oh yeah, man, I know it's pretty bad in other places or whatever, but it's real bad here. We have the real fascists, you know, hardcore, organized, Christian. We are the transphobia capital of the world. We have literal barons and dukes. Our prime minister is a political cartoon brought to life by a disgruntled wizard. We win evil. Where did you say you were from again? Ireland? Never heard of it. It sort of shuts down the conversation a little bit. The world is full of lots of very interesting places and lots of them operate with very different cultural assumptions. They have different needs, different priorities, and they have different resources. Countries make up as they go along their own approaches to political and economic systems. And we can learn a lot from the things that they do well and the things that they do badly and how globally hegemonic systems like capitalism, interact differently with different cultures. So you can say that America is the greatest country on earth, or that America is the most evil country on earth. Let's just say, okay? Let's just say. But are we having that conversation with a very American conception of greatness? A very American conception of evil? You see? That'd be a very Irish way of looking at it now, so it is. We're a fierce postmodern kind of a people. And so, when someone makes a sweeping statement like, the Middle East is just backwards, or indeed, you're not a real socialist, bro. You don't even have a tattoo of Mao on your face. It leads me to suspect that such people might have a limited understanding of all countries. And it's important to be interested in how all the other strange places work as we strive towards equality, or try to unpack cultural assumptions, or to dismantle colonialism, or to address the sort of naive realism that might plague a person who only understands how one country works. Here in Ireland, we don't have the luxury of only knowing how one country works. Our neighbors are too noisy. We know everything that they get up to. So that's number two, Iverado. 
That's why you should care about Ireland, because it's interesting and it's edifying and we do things differently here. Even though we all think that the way our own country does things is just normal, and in the context of a global pandemic we're all determined to return to normal. Here in Ireland we're determined to return to our own strange tea-drinking ash or it'll be grand brand of normal. And number three, use vegan rashers. Uh, use vegan black pudding, vegan butter. It's actually quite straightforward, just use vegan stuff. Oh, it's been a very strange year, hasn't it? It's been a very strange year. We've all been through some stuff. And I'm on YouTube, and I'm speaking English, the language of the most successful colonizers, which means that this video is accessible to all sorts of people in all sorts of places. Maybe you've been through epidemics before, but I hadn't. So my 2020 was very strange. And this global pandemic was very strange. It was strange seeing all of the different countries, rich and poor, belligerent and open-minded alike, decide how to respond to this crisis. Let's start by looking at normal in a sort of averaged out way. Normal is something we intuit. It's a euphemism. Normal as a word carries a lot of weight, but it doesn't carry a lot of meaning. Normal might mean seeing old friends, hugging your mom, getting on a plane and visiting your sister in Slovenia. Normal can mean all sorts of wonderful things. Normal might mean normal social spaces, hotels, fine dining. There's already a bit of a crisis in trying to get people back to work in those kinds of jobs. Because those kinds of jobs are awful. They're underpaid, overworked, it's deeply unsatisfying work, you often don't even get breaks. In America, such a career often means that your income depends very directly on your ability to take shit from assholes. Tipping culture, otherwise known as the opposite of opportunity. You meet people at their absolute worst and you still have to smile and I promise you I know what I'm talking about because I used to co-own and operate a vegan cafe. Seriously, I don't care what you say about my chopping, I was once a professional chef in a business that, that went out of business all horribly. Yeah. Normal might mean normal economic activity. Earlier in June, the Taunashta of Ireland, or the second in command, not really, urged consumers to spend, 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 and take the estimated 12 billion euro in household savings saved over the various lockdowns and spend it on a load of old shit. Normal might mean going to college and getting into huge amounts of debt. Normal might mean renting a new place and giving 90% of your income to someone who inherited a house in 1987. Normal might mean starting a new war with Iran because of oil, destroying the rainforest, setting up giant industrial blow torches to melt the polar ice caps for Jesus. I don't know what I'm saying. A Big Bang Theory reunion. Normal. Millennials drowning in debt. Normal is global inequality rising and that being linked to rates of clinical depression. Oh. oh, it's done. Sorry. Um, I think I need to go speak to my therapist, actually. So that's why, I don't know. I mean, it's just depressing. Like, I tried to make a community space with the cafe, with vegan food and board games and specialty coffee that was ethically sourced. But when people came in and didn't buy something and, and sat at tables, it would mean I didn't pay myself because I certainly couldn't not pay the landlord. And sometimes I'd struggle not to resent the people who were coming in just taking up space because space has been commodified, even though they're really in the same position as me, so poor that they can't pay their dues just to occupy a space. And even though I'd set up this space for exactly, exactly that purpose, I mean, a lot of the time I didn't pay myself. And, and like, how can it not be depressing being forced to see your fellow man as competition? How can it not be depressing to pay all of that rent and the taxes and get no help whatsoever while seeing, in Ireland, massive American corporations get sweetheart tax deals and special treatment and zoning deals and, and the bigger the company, the more wealth inequality they create and, and like maybe I'm just weak. Maybe my whole generation is just weak, lame, unable. And the generation that will come after us will be even weaker and lamer. But neither possibility 
that it's a blameless evil situation cultivated by a callous unethical system with a, a few callous unethical men, or that it's my fault, my weakness, and the weakness of my whole generation. Neither possibility is optimistic or cheerful or even actionable. I just want out. Can you just, can you help me? I'm anxious and I'm depressed and I'm, I'm not sure what to do. Hmm. hmm. Well, I actually can think of something. Is it CBT? Mindfulness? No, no, it's a paper with rules. Rules for life. <laughs> no, I, I don't want those rules. My room is already clean. Not those rules. Don't be silly. I would only give you something evidence-based. Ah, let me see. Here it is. <clears throat> Alternative top 10 tips for better health by the Townsend Center for International Poverty Research. And see, you're already in violation of tip number one. It's doing yoga, isn't it? No, 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 no. Here it is. Here it is. <clears throat> tip one. Don't be poor. If you, if you can, stop. If you can't, try not to be poor for long. What? There's more. Like like rule number three. Don't be disabled or have a disabled child. Don't. Just just don't. Four. Don't work in a stressful, low-paid manual job. Well, that's good. You just quit one of those. Though you're still in violation of rule number one. Wait, but but I don't know how to just stop doing any of this. They're not they're not realistic goals. Aren't you gonna teach me to do more breathing exercises? You know the breathing exercises, Neil. The breathing exercises aren't going to get you out. It's funny, I did an interview recently with Joe Rooney. Cool! And he asked me, why didn't you ever move to a big city? Because I'm non-binary and queer and poly and everything. And, and, and actually, it ended up really stuck in my head. But, but what I was really thinking was, why, why didn't you ever emigrate? Because I am all of those things, yes. But, but I've also always been so fucking poor. Mm-hmm. Rule number two. Don't live in a deprived area. If you do, move. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, but, but Ireland isn't deprived. Not really. It's, so many of its people are. Our GDP actually went up during the pandemic, but, but so did wealth inequality. And look, I stayed here for my children, but, but we can't all just fucking move. The government here shouldn't be expecting us to, to, like, to move like it feels like they are. In the last economic crash, the Financial Times reported in 2013 that there was an Irish person getting on a plane to live abroad every six minutes. Is that a hard thing to contemplate? Yes. You're right. You know you're right. You may like this other paper I have. Uh, uh, a literature review on, on the ways that structural systems interact with health. Ah, yes, here. It, although this mainstream orientation to social class and health inequalities may appear innocuous or politically neutral, it in fact functions in the service of incremental apolitical technical changes that are ultimately system justifying and status quo reproducing. It basically says that an impact of neoliberalism is health inequality. Mental health too, Neil. What paper is that? Two decades of neo-Marxist class analysis and health inequalities. A critical reconstruction. Is this therapy or, or, or tanky talk with Dr. Puppet? Neil, we can make your anxiety somewhat better. We can teach you coping skills and, and you can white knuckle your way through life. Or maybe Patreon will take off and you can afford to go to the doctor. You still haven't been, have you? You haven't been to the doctor. No. Since you almost died last summer? From the stomach ulcers? Actually, they were in my intestine. Well, maybe you can afford to go to a therapist that isn't a puppet. Hopefully it works. Coping mechanisms will put a link to some good evidence-based coping skills in the description. But what will really help you and everyone else systematically oppressed by all of this is to, well, get rid of neoliberalism. So let's do it. Let's. Just get rid of... This is your quest, Neil. <laughs> How do I even start? Well, okay. Here. I'll show you. You've got to 
tell them got to do your essay. Well, I'm a little blindsided. I don't know what to say. Well, we gotta run and the camera's on, so you know you can't hide. Where are you going? Hmm, let's let the market decide. People have to spend because there was no business during the pandemic. Yes, but by spending their collective 12 billion, it'll just seep out of working people's hands and into Jeff Bezos' giant pocket. This is why we need taxes. But Ireland is a tax haven. It's, it's a whole bit of the essay. It's the worst one in the world. Yeah, but it's so pretty. Just look at that scenery. Uh, what the fuck? Oh, no, it looks like it's part two already. Doesn't time fly when you're having fun? The market in our center, our little Google map, it tells us where we're going, so I can wake up. Wake up! When you follow market forces, the only way is up. Exponential growth, an ever filling cup. But what about our planet? And who picks all the crops? Slaves picking chocolate sold by wage slaves in shops Throwing out metric tons of good food with padlocks on the bins So that growing hungry homeless can't get in You have to have some halves You got to have have-nots It's not as if we'd all be happy just with what we've got And if you just work harder What, like when I almost died? Does working harder work? Hmm. Let's let the market decide! Oh, we're here. Neoliberalism, the old bastard, what does that word mean? It can mean all sorts of things. It's liberal in the economic sense, the reduction of government controls and regulations to pave the way for as much private enterprise and economic growth as possible. It can mean a reduction in government spending, but more consistently, neoliberal policies are what once was the remit of the state, the responsibility of the collective good, being turned instead into niches for commerce. So buses, healthcare, housing. Yes, sometimes housing can and should be the responsibility of the collective. Those things get sold, contracted. And the expectation, the plan, <laughs> the plan is that market forces make things high quality and efficient and good. And that deregulation makes things cheap. That's the idea, you make a lot of money. And there is some truth to a lot of that, you know, market forces do make things shiny and appealing and they make things cheap. But the other thing that market forces do is they make things half-assed, aggressive and half-assed. Have you ever noticed like when you're watching a Marvel movie or something and the special effects get all shite, like they were great and then suddenly they were shite. That's because lots of different CGI companies are working on different parts of the film simultaneously and they're trying to outbid one another. It's a race against time and a race to the lowest quote. It could also be argued that market forces have improved special effects over the years. They've made them better and they've made them worse. Because if it's cheaper to half-ass something and more efficient to half-ass something, then it literally cannot be whole-assed under capitalism. So if the very function of something is broken or damaging or evil, then market forces are very, very bad at getting it to stop doing it that way. Stop selling this, stop exploiting that. The myopic measure of something's purchasability does not map very well onto the other things that it needs to be in order to function or to improve or to be good. So like a landlord's shitty house with a, with a broken window and the black mold, if that's something that someone wants to pay money for, that they have to pay money for, then the market will decide that it is good. Neoliberalism is the politics of looking at this clambering, self-replicating, self-defecating, smoke and mirrors monstrosity that is the market. And politicians look at that and they say, oh good, 
We don't need to worry about any of our shit. We can just sell all our responsibilities to these guys. They seem to know what they're doing. There it is. That is where we must go. Do I... Do I keep doing the essay? Oh yeah, it's real good. Keep going. <laughs> Anyway, you don't need me to explain neoliberalism, but there you go, I, I did it anyway. But what's worse than it being a bad economic strategy or a bad ideology is that it disguises itself as neither. It's not an ideology, it's just common sense. It's just common sense. Man and woman, just common sense. The climate was always gonna get warmer, it's just common sense. We're all gonna die someday, it's just common sense. I have to have a gun or somebody might try to steal my gun and then I won't be able to shoot them with my gun. So it's just common sense if I hear another fucking thing about common sense. Uh, Neil? Ireland? Ireland. Ireland. Ireland was always primed to be what we think of now as neoliberal. British colonization and the atrocities committed under British rule led to a deeply ingrained right to own land and to govern your own destiny. A people who had all of their land taken away, being obsessed with buying land and owning land and selling land makes a certain amount of sense. I've the right to 50 houses up on the hill and I'll rent them out if I want and I'll burn them down if I want and I'll let them rot if I want. My ancestors didn't fight the British for me to not do that. British rule also meant that for hundreds of years, any relationship to a central government in London was a complete joke. So we have always been, and we remain still, all about those local politics. Who's gonna buy you a pint? Who's gonna fill in your pothole? Any ideology, partisan politics even, any big picture thinking, it's not gonna manifest in voting, so it doesn't manifest in politics either. So in the Republic of Ireland, oh, do I have to cover that? Do I have to do the north-south divide thing? I'm not going to. This video is already about like 50 things. Just watch the Cogito video. It's, it's good. Uh, his stuff is very good. Here in the Republic, we've bounced back and forth between two right-of-center parties. That It really is like choosing between two kinds of tin opener in Ikea. I know a lot of people feel that way about domestic politics in their various countries, but trust me, in this case, it is especially true. We're trapped in neoliberalism here, not because one party has the ideological advantage over the population, nor is it because one party ratchets the other into the center and makes any basic decency look like revolutionary social reform. I'm looking at you, United States. No, here in Ireland, we're trapped in this lackluster, no decision-making, tighten your belts on public expenditure and steer this train right into homelessness and climate catastrophe because we have two main parties that are essentially the same. In fact, right now they're in coalition with each other and it's been a mealy-mouthed, half-assed, half-ruthless, let's open all the restaurants, half, oh, think of the people response to the pandemic. And now there are desperate cries to return to normal, to, to get out and spend. The last thing that made Ireland particularly open for business as far as neoliberalism is concerned is our absolute devotion to foreign investment. Our former Taoiseach, Enda Kenny, in fact described Ireland as a great little business to do country in. I mean, a great little country to do business in. Of course, that's what I mean. And he should know, he's sold us out enough times. You're familiar with the Celtic Tiger. That was a period of rapid economic growth for Ireland. Our GDP went up by almost 10% every year between 1995 and 2000. And anyway, it was a load of bollocks. It was just various Irish governments under Fine Gael, party number one, represented here as Mark Zuckerberg, just shafting the globe and the American people and the Irish people out of taxes from mostly US companies. More on that part later. But the important thing was that a lot of companies with operations overseas or just on the cloud suddenly had their home office in this little green country that could, that refused to ever be poor again and just so happened to have a how low can you go corporate tax rate. And the Celtic Tiger was what happened when another government came along under Fianna Fáil, party number two represented here as data from Star Trek to avoid confusion. And they said, well, you know what would be a good thing to do with all of that wealth? 
Fucking stupid shit, that's what. Let's incentivize speculation to make houses so affordable that no one can afford them. We'll build a big spire, like the Eiffel Tower in the middle of Dublin. We'll build a, a petrol station dedicated to Barack Obama. Ideology thus remains largely hidden in the apparatus of Irish politics. Its presence is barely articulated and often invisible. And yet Ireland was characterized over the Celtic Tiger period by a range of practices which bear important similarities, discursively and materially, with key processes of neoliberalization, as opposed to an ideologically informed project such as those implemented by Thatcher in the UK and Reagan in the USA during the 1980s, Irish neoliberalism was produced through a set of short-term, intermittently reformed deals brokered by the state with various companies, individuals and representative bodies, which cumulatively restructured Ireland in unsustainable and geographically uneven ways. Investing in property with American money, well, what could possibly go wrong? You've seen The Big Short, you know what can possibly go wrong. Go watch The Big Short. All that American money, you naughty bastards. You killed so many of us. Ding, 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 how you doing? Top of the morning to you, you wanna buy a banana? Oh, what is it now? We got all kinds of banana, fresh, Irish, long as the day is wide, and twice as bendy as my old father used to say. Ding, ding, ding. No, that's very nice, thank you, but if you'll excuse us, we just need to get past. Hey, whoa, 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 you can't go in there without buying something. Why not? But that would be loitering. What, you'd rather I loitered with a banana? Oh, that's not loitering, that's spending. Look, I don't want to fucking- You don't even have any bananas! Ha <laughs> yeah, uh, ha <laughs> funny thing, uh, these are just the headquarters for the bananas, so they, they're grown in Honduras and the company is Japanese, but, but the headquarters are here, which makes these Irish bananas. Irish, mm-hmm, wanna buy one? But there aren't- I Thank you. You know, for a therapist, you're not much help. And how does that make you feel? Uh, say, you fellas wouldn't be interested in buying some social media, would you? No. Oh, that's a damn shame. Fresh Irish social media, lots of room for expansion, plenty of, uh, ad revenue. I don't understand. How do you sell social... I don't understand. How can you sell social media from a stall? We got Facebook, Twitter, we got uh, Google, we got Apple, we got Microsoft, all Irish, you could use them. Why do companies like Apple and Facebook seem to like it so much here? In 2016, the European Commission found that Ireland had granted illegal tax benefits to Apple. That in fact, Apple had paid so little in tax. Excuse me, uh, who are you talking to? Th them. Oh, I see. Carry on. That Apple had paid so little in tax, they owed Irish Revenue, the government agency in charge of tax, 13.1 billion euro. But thankfully, the Irish government swung into the rescue. They took the case all the way to the European General Court, not so that Apple would pay, but so that Ireland would be allowed not to make them. And they won. They rejected payment of the back taxes. They rejected a figure that, inclusive of penalties, <coughs> 20 billion fucking euro. Amounted to 10% of Irish GDP at the time. Because... Neoliberalism, right? We have to attract direct foreign investment, right? Hey, uh, you don't think the uh, leprechaun economist gag is a little on the nose? According to the report, almost all sales profits recorded by the two companies, 
two companies, oh yes, Apple Sales International and Apple Operations Europe, two very different companies, clearly. Remember that, it's important. Sales profits from the two companies were internally attributed to a head office. The commission's assessment showed that these head offices existed only on paper and could not have generated such profits. They were using a tax trick. In Ireland, you can claim capital allowance, tax deduction basically, for intangible assets. So, in 2015, an Irish subsidiary of Apple, company number one, and definitely an Irish company, Steve McJobs and all that, purchased $300 billion worth of intangible assets from a different subsidiary of Apple, which enabled Apple to write off 300 billion fucking dollars as a capital allowance against future Irish profits. That's how capitalism works. If you want to make it in the world, you just have to work a little harder and save up and then use a greedy, poverty traumatized country to, you know, buy 300 billion dollars worth of nothingness from your own company so you never have to pay any tax. And you don't have to worry about getting in hot water for that because the greedy government of said poverty traumatized country will go to international court and fight for you in order to make sure you never contribute to the public good. Wow. Jeez, that's real bad. Yes. You know, I didn't even want this part. But the public good is sort of helpless in the face of Irish neoliberalism. There's sort of two things happening at once, not just the privatization of social services. And if I'm speaking to people from America, by the way, where, where everything's already private and extortionate, then sorry. But imagine that the state actually provided social services for the people in the country. And then they started to sell off those social assets to cousins and friends and the already wealthy enough to invest. Uh, often selling them off to entities from outside of Ireland. But there's another even worse process at play. We don't just privatize the state's gains, we nationalize the state's losses. This is what happened during the economic crash of 2007 and 2008 with the recapitalization and nationalizing of the failing Irish banks with taxpayer money. Yes, as an Irish taxpayer, I now own part of a bank. Sure I do. Yeah, that's how that works. Maybe that means that I can set up a company to buy intangible assets from myself. No, of course not. Economists and capitalist realists love to point to Ireland as a, a poster child for austerity. If you just knuckle down and pay your dues, then you'll have whiplash from the speed of the economic recovery. When the reality is that by bailing out the banks and borrowing 22.5 billion from the International Monetary Fund, barely a spoonful of jizz in comparison to an American military budget, or if you like, about one Apple tax bill, nevertheless, the average per person debt in Ireland shot up from $9,000 per person in the year 2000 to over $40,000 in person in the year 2010. That figure is now closer to $50,000 per person, by the way. And a person was getting on a plane every six minutes to leave Ireland forever. And the national debt of the United States is $26 trillion. So, so call me economically naive, but what the fuck is going on with capitalism? Oh, it's so silly. Our system is so silly. And they don't even conceive of it as an ideology, it's just common sense. So when we go back to normal, it'll just be spend, 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 so that borrow, 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 so that Apple can sell imaginary apples to Apple, and then when the bubble bursts, it'll just be up to us to pay the debt, because then it'll be real debt. I don't know how to get people to organize against something so big and hegemonic. How to get people to just vote a little bit to the left. To, to, to stop facilitating wealth hoarding. To not privatize social assets and to not socialize private losses. Why are we here? What are we supposed to do? It takes action, Neil. And all that has been happening under capitalism and neoliberalism is reaction. Recovery instead of reform, but an act always involves a radical risk. And that's what we must do. That's why we're here. That's all very poetic, but I don't know what that substantively is. 
You don't need to have all the answers. You just need a few of your own. Answers that you can stand by. And the only thing you need is a lot of like-minded friends with good answers of their own. To the big questions. You don't need to know everything. You just need to get organized to act. Look out, Neo! <laughs> Hold! Who dares to challenge me? I'm Neil. I'm the liberal cook. Liberal! Liberal! I am a social justice warrior, and I cannot allow liberals to proceed any further. Liberals are the reason we have not taken any action. Well, actually, I'm a leftist. Really? Yeah, it's a pun. Liberal, cook, cookaldry, cooking. You understand? No. But you are a leftist? Yes. And so am I. And so am I. Once there were many of us here, but then came the great trash fire, an endless debate that lasted longer than time itself. One by one we succumbed to the logical inconsistencies. Some thought that the liberals should be our allies, that incremental change is good, etc. Others thought that the liberals actively stood in the way of real radical change because they used capitalism to do everything. Things got messy. We called each other class traitors and resorted to ad hominem and straw man attacks. The leftist alliance broke apart. I am the only one left now. Well, we could form a new leftist alliance. You and me, and my therapist. One built on a foundation of collaboration, open communication, good faith arguments, metamodernism, and evidence-based social, economic, health, and ecological principles. What do you say? I say yay! yay! Oh boy! A leftist collective! This is my lucky day! I'm Fernando, by the way! The centrist wind, not the north wind, nor the south wind, but the wind of the center, the wind that brings no change. We have to be very careful here. I can understand wanting to return to normal. Given the sheer amount of stuff that has to change, it's easy to get depressed, overwhelmed. So. When presented with this light at the end of the tunnel, this uh, dangling carrot as presented by governments and the media and capitalism itself of spending and, and getting back in the office and consuming and, uh, <laughs> you know, perpetuating the status quo and uh, never changing anything politically ever except to occasionally pay lip service to how unpleasant homelessness is or or to the uh, undesirability of racism, etc., etc. Well, that does feel like a light at the end of the tunnel. That is comforting. It's a light in an otherwise dark and empty room. But this is, this is the ideology again. <laughs> Presenting itself as factual reality, as common sense. But we can change. In Ireland, during the pandemic, we actually had a partially progressive response in the form of the Pandemic Unemployment Payment, which isn't quite the same as stimulus checks, which position themselves as economic stimulus and are intermittent and inconsistent and in any case kind of weird. No, this was a consistent weekly payment for people made unemployed by the pandemic. And it was pissy pennies and it kept getting reduced, but in any case, 
what we had was essentially a form of universal basic income. Or we could have. And for many people during that time, in spite of the horror happening globally and their fear for their loved ones, they thrived. They were solvent for the first time in years on less than the minimum amount calculated by the state necessary to survive, many people were better off than they had been in years. But now we must return, not only to work that sucks, dehumanizes, is often specifically designed to have soul crushing repetition, redundancy, obedience, and meaninglessness, but we must do so in order to make less than less than the minimum amount calculated by the state to survive and go back to struggling to pay rent and bills. And if we don't, we're lazy. That's an ideology. That's policy. We have chosen to let the market have that much power over us. And in Ireland's case, those policies aren't that difficult to spot or to correct for. But by framing it as common sense, then anyone who proposes that it is in fact not very sensible and certainly not innate can be branded as an idealist, a fool, a communist or a hippie or whatever thing, not someone you should vote for. So the pandemic unemployment payment becomes a bit of a political football. News outlets tell us about businesses that can't get their employees back the state uses the seduction of capital itself to persuade us that this game, this game of no rights, badly paid employment and direct foreign investment, tax evasion, and our chosen dependence on cheating the rest of the world out of wealth equality has become so foundational and basic and needed that we as a population can't imagine trying to benefit from it. And it makes it so difficult to imagine change that awareness of the thing and despair about the thing become impossible to distinguish. No, I believe in change. I believe in, in goodness. No! No. The fact that in a country with rich farmland and a history of colonization and an educated workforce and the sexiest people in the world, we should feel doomed to be America's accountant, America's fixer, America's fluffer is just gross. But if I don't like it, there is another normal, inevitable cowardice that we like to fall back on here. Emigrate. Why don't you just go? Why don't you just fuck off if you don't like it here? We can't all- Why don't you leave since you don't like it? Because we can't all emigrate! We can't just leave! You can't send away all your young people forever! No scene, no culture, no soul, no young voters, no ambition, no dreams! Just the market, just neoliberalism! Forever! Secure that older vote and make sure you lie to them because they'll just fucking eat it up! I thought you were sound, Joe! I am sound. This is just your imagination. I... I think you need therapy, Neil. I love Ireland. I love it. We don't, we don't want to go. We want to make it better. We didn't do this. We didn't do this. Fucking sick of it. The bog of despair was inside their very minds now. They were more bog than man. Well, non binary person. 
are also puppets. And the lesson they learned is that the citadel of capitalism cannot be destroyed by the hands of mere mortals such as you or I or them. And so their story ended as all the stories of the heroes of Ireland who went before them did, in tragedy and defeat. Oh, the bog, the despair, the neoliberal capitalist realism. Would you stop? This is my fucking essay. I'm not small. This is a community. I, and community is the... Community is the halfway house between what we're trying to achieve and what we need to achieve it. Organization. Mutual care and culturalism. That's what I needed. Grassroots. Organization. In this community, us, we need to do, to organize, not criticize. Comment below, comment below please. Tell me what you're doing, what's next? What, what are you organizing to do? <laughs> My community. You have learned the first lesson, but the Citadel still awaits. I knew this was going to be a two-parter. That's it. If I take one more step, I'll be further from home than I've ever been. Alright. That's enough references for one day, okay? Hello again. Uh, thanks to all of Neil's patrons. And if you do want to support Neil's channel, that's actually a very good way of doing it. In fact, I hear that the making of for this video is going to be very, very good. And Neil, Neil's fairly sound as well. They'll say hello to you and everything. As well as that though, uh, big thanks to everyone who helped out with this video. A big thank you to legendary comedian Joe Rooney and to, let's see, um, uh, me. Um, I, I actually do have my own channel. I, I think there's a link down there somewhere. I'm, I'm very good, very good actually, like really good, really good YouTube channel. Neil wrote this part. Um... I do have a channel. I am Hog from the channel Hog and Dice. My channel is mostly about Irish folklore. I tell stories that I've dug out of Ireland's National Folklore Archive. And I analyse aspects of Irish folklore for their themes, motifs, and historical implications. I've been studying this subject for six years in university. I may as well get some kind of use out of it. Uh, thank you for watching this video. I do hope you've enjoyed it. And I hope that you have a good night, or evening, or morning, depending entirely upon your time zone and what time you've chosen to watch this video. Goodbye.